A while back, I did a video on the House of the Dragon costume hits, and I promised that I would follow up with the misses. If you love the costumes for the show, this video is not for you, so instead I will leave the other video as a pinned comment if you want to check it out. But if you notice something off about the costumes at any time while watching in a recent season, but you weren't able to put your finger on it, or there was one costume or item that got stuck in your craw, then this is the video for you. I will aim to be constructive at all times, and as well, I'm harder on a show like this in the same way that critics will analyze the production design, writing, acting, CGI, and the like because it's an enormous budget and my expectations are much higher than they would be for an independent film or lower budget TV show. Before I proceed, there will be spoilers for all 10 episodes of House of the Dragon. Also, I might touch on the books occasionally, but if you are a show-only watcher, I won't take it beyond where we leave the show off at the end of the season. I have created chapters so you can skip ahead at any time if you don't want to sit through the entire video. Now let's get to it. Ill-fitting costumes. I front-loaded this because of all the misses. The silhouette is one of the most important attributes of a costume, in my humble opinion. You can have the most incredible design down on paper, but if the costume isn't brought about with a level of expertise, it will look like crap no matter how much trim or beading or embroidery you slap on it. I'm not taking issue with the men's costumes as much, which for the most part look pretty great. My biggest grievances is with the women's outfits. Throughout the season, some obvious dents and creases and bumps shouldn't have been there. The lack of decent foundation garments or underwear on the women isn't helping the situation when the cast is often wearing modern undergarments like strapless bras, but it's also the pattern drafting and cutting and sewing of the costumes. I'm not sure what went down here, but maybe it was due to COVID or a lack of time or money as the reason they had to cut corners. There were also a few instances where on camera, you could see the costume had been let out and the creases from the original seams were still obvious. Just to give you a bit of understanding about the costume process, the typical approach is that you create a mock-up or toile of a dress out of muslin, like these examples from couture designers Charles James and Christian Dior before you cut it out of the real fabric so that you can make any adjustments to the flat pattern. I think for time this important step was missed. While most of Allison's costumes look pretty good, Rhaenyra, the show's leading lady, had some of the worst fitting costumes with the biggest offender being her yellow gold silk gown with the short sleeves. What a way to start the show. I also think that the trim around the neckline looked very odd in the way it stuck straight up, like they didn't know what to do with the collar, so they just bound it in some trim and called it a day. Her long sleeve gold gown wasn't much better. Rhaenyra's morning costume was beautifully designed, but her Spencer jacket, it's badly cut. You can see the pucker on the sleeves. As an adult, Rhaenyra's red gown with the laced on sleeves worn in the second half of the season is also ill-fitting. From what I can tell here, the bus point is in the wrong place, so the princess seams don't line up correctly with her bust. Yes, I understand that the character was pregnant, but they knew that from the outset. My most anticipated costume of the season, Rhaenyra's black cloak fabric gown that had been teased with her head and shoulders, I was expecting it to be a season stealer. What a disappointment. The seaming at the front where the pregnancy belly, it looks bulky and thick. And while I love the embroidery, the applique does no favors by drawing your eye in that direction. And finally, the sleeves look slouchy and creased. I also wasn't crazy about how they managed the gathers around the baby bump on Emma Targaryen. Surely they could have come up with a creative way to work around that. And I saw one of the pregnancy bellies used in the show in a behind the scenes picture, and it was some kind of weird strap on padding. In my experience, the baby bump is custom made for the actor to conform to their torso. And I'm sad to say that while I think Eve Best looked great in most of her costumes as Rainey's Targaryen, this pretty peacock blue silk gown looks bad on her mainly when she is sitting. 
In a close-up of the costume, it looks like the side front panel is gathered into the seam, and I think that a good foundation garment or even a built-in structure would have done a world of good. The same goes for Allison's slippery when wet gown. I noticed that some of the women in the background wore gowns that pancaked them, meaning their bust was flattened in their costumes. But one background character that I spotted in a tightly fitted costume was Viserys' footman when he arrives for the hunt. This isn't as much of a design thing, but a lack of attention to detail. I would have just asked to swap him out for a background person that would fit the costume. Problem solved. Incohesive Design House of the Dragon is a fantasy setting, but there are real-world implications when creating a design of costumes worn by mortals, living on an Earth-like planet that has gravity, an atmosphere, and supply chain routes not unlike our own, even if this world is inhabited by dragons and magic. Yet, as I am writing this, I am still confused. I was hoping that after the season ended, I could make sense of it all, but I can't wrap my head around the costume design because it appears that there are too many things going on. According to the showrunners, they were aiming to have House of the Dragon feel like it is still tied to the world of Game of Thrones, so as viewers, you feel like you are in the same universe. I thought that was a great approach, and while the showrunners have the ultimate say, Bells went off for me when I learned that the costume design team had to answer to multiple episode directors and not just the showrunners like they did with Dave and Dan, love or hate them, on Game of Thrones. This can create a disjointed design because each director will have their own vision for their episodes. George R. R. Martin has stated in interviews that A Song of Ice and Fire is loosely based upon the Hundred Years' War and the Wars of the Roses, which took place roughly from the early 14th century until the late 15th century. Meanwhile, the story of the Dance of the Dragons is based upon a time period in history called the Anarchy, which was a civil war in England and Normandy between 1138 and 1153. In HBO's Game of Thrones, while in Westeros the world was inspired by the British medieval period, costume-wise, each region has its own historical and cultural inspirations with a smattering of haute-couture fashions thrown in for good measure. And while taking inspiration from this historical time period, Game of Thrones series costume designer Michelle Clapton created a unique look for every region without you ever looking at it and thinking, hey, I've seen that somewhere before. It's its own thing. There were times when I could tell where she got her ideas, but ultimately she would change it up and make it her own. But most importantly, it would serve the character. So a 12th century setting might make sense given that the story is set 170 to 200 years before the events of Game of Thrones. But would the late 12th century reflect the Targaryen dynasty when they are at the height of their power? Maybe not, so instead it appears that the production design team decided to move slightly forward in history and go with the Renaissance, covering the 15th and 16th centuries as their main historical influence. With that, it makes things kind of awkward, given that some of the costumes worn by the men don't look that much different than Game of Thrones. Now, in our personal world, people living 170 years ago would not know the existence of jeans or zippers or t-shirts or bell bottoms or tie-dye or pleated pants, so it's odd to see so little difference a few hundred years can make. So if the team had stayed within 200 years, I could maybe get on board with that, but at times, the clothing spans the gamut of the 6th century Byzantine era, the 14th 15th, and even 16th centuries. And at one point, young Lena even has a wig that appears to be from the 18th century. Now, costume designer Jenny Tamim said in an interview, I did use in the costume a lot of elements from the 13th and 14th century. I went further than medieval because I wanted to show that they were in the upper tails of their dynasty. So, for instance, the servers are dressed in sideless surcoats from about the 14th century, The noble men and women are dressed in clothing from the Renaissance, while Alicent, Otto, and Rhaenyra appear to be inspired by the Medicis, the Tudors, and the Elizabethan period. 
And the costume designer has also borrowed from real world historical references. So for instance, Allison's green dress looks very much like Bernadette Banner's creation of this red gown depicted in the 15th century painting, St. George Slaying the Dragon. And I would have loved to have seen what Jenny Tamim's mood boards look like because as I have commented on some of my early reaction videos, some of the costumes look like they were influenced by the medieval period, but through a Ren Faire or even a 1980s lens. So for example, the collar of Lena's gold brocade dress looks like something you might see on a prom or bridesmaid dress from the era. And Lena's pentos gown looks influenced by the wedding gown designs of Jessica McClintock from like the 1990s. And at other times, Allison's fur trim cape and tween Lena's costume look like they might even be inspired by Disney princesses. So ultimately, this lack of cohesiveness along with the attention to the fit of the costumes, it's really disappointing to me. Now that COVID is behind us, and perhaps with one season under their belt, I hope we can look forward to seeing a more solid costume design in future seasons. Armor. For the most part, I like the designs of most of the armors. There are my usual quibbles that we see in fantasy shows and movies that have become a trope, you know, the lack of mail underneath plate armor with lots of gaps and crevices where pointy things can get access to, you know, the lack of leg armor on the thighs when that is one of the most vulnerable parts of the body, and studded leather armor with no purpose other than to look cool. But you know, I'm over it. But there were a few things that I noticed in the House of the Dragon armor that didn't work for me. Now, it's a strange thing that I will be comparing some of the armors from Game of Thrones, given that costume effects supervisor Simon Brindle has returned to House of the Dragon. You know, he's kind of a big deal having left Game of Thrones after just two seasons to work with Marvel and on some other really big projects like Dune and Foundation. So let's start with Damon's tourney armor. According to Brindle, Damon's armor took 16 weeks to originate the shape and another 8 to 10 weeks to manufacture. I like the design of it, but in an interview, Jenny said of Damon's armor that from the design, it's molded first. They're sculptors, so they molded every piece and then they put the piece together. They make it in a very light plastic. So after that comment, I'm not sure if the final product is made from plastic, but to me, it doesn't look like steel. Here's an example of Loras Tyrell's tourney armor from season one of Game of Thrones versus Daemon Targaryen's armor. And for historical references, there's some examples of some 16th century tournament armors. You can see the difference between the 16th century steel armors and Daemon's armor. And my fellow queen Tatiana Melendez said in our very first live stream, you could see Daemon's helmet bend during the joust, which leads me to believe that it's plastic or a very flimsy metal. And added to that, the ruby gemstones, which are set in the eyes of the dragon helmet and on his breastplate, look plastic and not Austrian or Swarovski crystals, which are a costume go-to item and have more sparkle. And comparing it to some of Simon Brindle's marvelous work that he created on Game of Thrones, like the Kingsguard armor, the Mountain, and the Hound, some of the best armors in fantasy, Damon's armor just doesn't even hold a candle to it. I have the same quibble with Rainey's armor. Simon Brindle said it took 10 to 12 weeks to model Rainey's armor. In the books, Rainey's armor is steel and copper, but Jenny to me wanted the house colors of red and black. I take no issue with that, but while the scales are made of leather, according to Tamim, other portions of her armor, like the pauldrons and the breastplate, they look like they're made of plastic. And the black gems, like in Damon's armor, also look like they're plastic. And finally, I want to address Rhea Royce's armor. This is a bit of fan service, in my opinion, with Rhea hawking while wearing what George R. R. Martin describes in the books of Game of Thrones as ancient bronze plate armor inscribed with runes. While not bronze plate armor, it's hardened leather armor with the addition of metal plates. Now that aside, I don't have a problem with the armor itself. It's actually, you know, really beautifully made. What my quibble is here is that Rhea has boob armor. Again, it's one of the old fantasy tropes that needs to die. 
We also saw it in Game of Thrones with the Sand Snakes, and I hated it then. Women can wear armor without it as seen in the silhouette of Rainey's armor, which works around her bust without accentuating it, and or like the amazing armors of Brienne of Tarth. The Crowns A few weeks back, one of my viewers pointed out to me that some of the costume bits, like the crowns, were not designed by the costume designer, but by the props department. I found this odd because as a rule of thumb, at least from my own experiences, is that anything the actor wears, like a crown or jewelry, is a costume accessory. And anything an actor holds, like a weapon or a parasol, is a prop. But somehow the crowns ended up with props And it's too bad because, in my opinion, they kind of bungled it. Firstly, they went in a completely different direction design-wise. I don't mind Viserys' crown so much. I mean, it looks nothing like King Jaharis' crown as described in the books, but I'm not sure why they went in a more Celtic direction. But Aegon the Conqueror's crown is just plain ugly, with that sad little ruby in the center. But the biggest issue is the 3D printing. Viserys' crown looks like it's plastic, and even though they said in a behind-the-scenes video that Aegon's crown was printed in resin and then copper-plated on top of that nickel-plated on top of that iron-plated, it looks like it's made from styrofoam. Just to show you the difference, in Game of Thrones, many of the crowns and tiaras were designed by Michelle Clapton and then handcrafted for the show from brass or silver by Steenson's Jewelers in Ireland. And I'll also add to this that while I don't mind the design of Viserys' Phantom of the Opera style mask, it was also managed by the props department, 3D printed and then plated, and again, it looks plastic. Repetition and Continuity of Costumes Costumes can say many things about a character, including what is happening in the environment, including the climate, season or the time of day, the mood of the character, and their economic status, but they can also indicate the passage of time. With the help of the script, the costume design team might do a breakdown of how many changes each character might require in each episode. I am more than happy to see each character wear the same outfit more than once. Arya, for instance, wore the same outfit for three seasons in Game of Thrones. But the costumes still have to tell the story. So in this section, I'm adding in some weird repetitions of costumes where there should likely have been a new costume. In addition, with the significant time jumps in season one, this would also have been an opportunity to show the aging and major changes in a character through costume. To start with, I'm going to use Allison as an example. So in episode two, The Rogue Prince, Allison wears her teal blue dress throughout the entire episode over three days. It would be one thing if she was wearing a linen shift under it, which is a medieval version of underwear that can be laundered and to keep the overgown clean, but she's not wearing one. Three years later, she's back in the same gown, which, okay, it's a little weird given that she is the queen, but her hair, necklace, earrings, and belt are all the same. It's like they were filming these episodes back to back and she just walked off of one soundstage and onto another. And you don't have to be a costume person to even notice this anomaly. It was all over Twitter. In episode three, second of his name, Allison wears this lovely velvet gown with the hair snood for when they go on the hunt. But then Allison and the entire hunting party appear to pull an all-nighter, wearing the same outfits the next morning at breakfast. I could see this working for the men, maybe, but Queen Allison and Baby Aegon continue to wear this outfit into the evening of the second day. Even Viserys gets changed into his jammies before retiring for the night. My friends, that stinky girl needs a bath. The next example I have is Rhaenyra. Unlike Game of Thrones, when the young cast aged throughout the series, we know that Millie Alcock is to age three and a half years by the third episode. But when we have the time jump, Rhaenyra is back in the same outfit she wore when she was 14. So it would be helpful if the wardrobe team came up with some ideas on how to make Rhaenyra look older. If they didn't have the budget for another outfit, they could have made her sleeves or her hem a bit shorter or even modified the dress in some way. 
someone mentioned to me in the comments that maybe she loved those outfits and had the royal seamstress whip up a new set of the same outfits. But I know that the gold dress is the same because I can see where they let out the seams on her shoulder, as I mentioned in the previous section. For Damon, and this falls on hair and makeup as well, he looks nearly the same age 19 years later in the Lord of Tides episode, wearing the same long line doublet and overgown that he wore at Emma's funeral in the premiere episode, The Heirs of the Dragon. And Corley's, one of the richest men in Westeros, is also wearing the same outfit almost two years later. It might be a plan for next season to hire a person to track the continuity of all of the costumes. Wigs. And this is a hard one. While many of the cast in Game of Thrones wore wigs, we only had three Targaryens in the entire eight seasons. Of those three, one looked really bad, and I'll let you guys guess which one. To be fair to House of the Dragon, it's really hard to wig so many people in silver hair and have it look natural. Even Matt Smith said that his wig looked best from the side, but he didn't think it looked as good from the front. So for the purpose of this section, I'm just going to highlight the ones that I thought were the worst offenders. Okay, guys, I've tried to like it, but the wig design I hate the most is Rainey's. It's just really weird, and it's unattractive on Eve Best, who in real life is a very beautiful woman. In the books, Rhaenys has black hair instead of the silver white hair of the Targaryens. Maybe they wanted to make it less confusing for the viewers. I don't really mind it, but it's the shape of her wig that I can't stand. In another live stream, Tatiana said that she thought it looked like the xenomorph creature designed by H.R. Giger in the Alien movies. Seriously, you can't unsee it. And as my viewer Melissa mentioned, her hair looks so much better at the funeral. And I agree. I like most of Rhaenyra's hairstyles, except for the one worn at her pre-wedding dinner. It looked top-heavy and not pretty or flattering, like the braids and coils on Daenerys Targaryen throughout the Game of Thrones seasons. As my viewer Melissa also said, there was a lost opportunity to have a beautiful tiara instead of the sad little rubies set into her beehive updo and some kind of weird hairpin on the back that I couldn't make out. Now, of course, the props department might have bungled the tiara as well. One of the things that I was very uncomfortable with is that they didn't bring in a hair person who has experience working with people of color. Of all the wigs, Corley's and Lena's hair is the best, but young Lena's wig, it's an absolute embarrassment. As mentioned in some of our House of the Dragon live streams, one of the biggest problems with the wigs we had are those worn by the Valerions. It's odd to me that in the pre-production stage, even if it was all done through Zoom, at no point did one of the higher-ups say, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't look right, when by golly they should have. Surely someone did some sketches and then there would have been some screen tests and approval before going to camera. Even if this was ultimately the wig designer's fault, the buck should stop at the showrunners who let this get through. And I'm also not crazy about Damon and Lena's two young daughters, Bela and Raina Targaryen, having locks. It doesn't even really make sense story-wise since Lena has ringlets and Damon has straight hair. But then in the flash forward... Bela has ringlets of her mother, while Reyna has this horrible head of locks in a half updo. It was so overwhelming to her pretty face. So come Emmy time, it will be interesting to see how the show fares. Let me know in the comments if any costumes didn't work for you. And if you're feeling exhausted after my constant whinging throughout this video, check out my House of the Dragon hits video, Hopefully you will feel refreshed and ready for season two. As always, thank you for spending time with me. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Please remember to hit the subscribe button as well as the bell 